Hey guys, let's look at some work energy power. Now this section is probably going to be about the toughest section that you're going to face in the whole of the physics syllabus. It's not particularly because uh, the maths is very hard, it's because the thinking is hard. Um, the questions can be asked in so many different ways and there's vertical things and slopes and horizontal things and rough surfaces and smooth surfaces and it all just gets quite confusing as to know even where to begin. So um, let's get a quick overview of things. Work Energy Power has basically got um, four kind of little chapters to it and they start easy and then get harder and harder and harder and harder and then the last one's easy. So the first one we'll have a look at just now is work, then EMEC, closed systems, the, the top of the hill, the big hairy giant, uh, is open systems and when you've got friction and it's all around WNET and then we finish off with power which is pretty, pretty straightforward. So I want to tackle this whole thing in about in two different episodes. We're first of all going to have a look at work and uh, EMEX systems, and then we'll take a breather, do some practice, and then we'll have a look at the big hairy giant who lives at the top of the hill. Okay, so work. Work, work, work. What is it all about? It's not just something that Rihanna and Fifth Harmony do. Um, it is something that we all got to do, and it's defined by this equation. So putting that in words, Work is done when a force moves through a distance. That's a nice way to define it. Work is done when a force moves through a distance. Okay, And the cos theta just helps us to take into account, well, what's the difference in angle between the force and the displacement? Um, or is it in the right direction? So let's have a quick, quick look at a few um, examples to get our head around what work is all about. It's not, it's not that tricky, um, but there's a couple of key concepts that I don't want you to miss. So imagine a, an object just on a, on a surface being pulled with a 10 newton force and it's it moves 5 meters. Plug it in there, 10 times 5, cos of naught is 1, so therefore the work done in this scenario is simply going to be 50. By the way, if ever any of these videos are too fast, you can always rewind, watch them again, watch them again, watch them again until you feel comfortable with it, or even watch them in slow mo because then it's easy to follow. I'm kidding. Uh, so uh, the second one is where you have something like this. Let's say it also moves five meters, but this time the 10 newtons is pulling at an angle of 30 degrees. Now what's the work done? Okay. Well. Still 10 newtons, 10, still 5 meters times 5, but obviously we use cos of 30 this time, which is root 3 over 2 or 0 0.866, which when you multiply it by 50 is 43,3. So we'll just leave it as 43 round figures. Okay. So it's slightly less work done than, than when it was a purely horizontal force because some of this force is now deployed vertically and not all doing work, moving it through the necessary distance. Then the third little scenario would be when we're looking at a force that actually isn't doing any of the moving. Sorry, wrong way. And that would be, for example, an upwards force, like normal, like a normal force. So let's say the object's moving, maybe it's freewheeling or something along a surface, going still traveling five meters, and this vertical force is acting. How much work does it do? Well, it's still 10, it's still five, but our theta now is 90. Cos of 90 is in fact naught. So the whole thing becomes naught, and we can see that that normal or whatever type of force it is is not doing any work whatsoever. So that's an important thing to realize is that any vertical forces or, or rather perpendicular forces to the motion never do any work. The normal is the laziest force you will ever find because it never works. And then the last one is um, the case of something like friction perhaps. So let's say the object was traveling in that direction. But the force that we're considering was in that direction. Those are exactly opposite each other. In other words, 180 degrees apart. Therefore, theta is 180. So we've still got our, te our, our, our 10 and our 5. But cos of 180 is minus 1. Which means it's still 50. But it's in fact minus 50. Now this produces a little bit of a dilemma. And this is the most important thing that I wanted you to get out of this little thing about work um, is that you can have negative work. Not because it's work to the left. Don't, be mis don't misunderstand that because it's not a vector. Work is in fact a scalar. 
but we can have positive and negative work because sometimes work is being put in to the system. It's being added to the box or to the trolley or to whatever it is that's being pushed. It's making it go faster. As opposed to this negative work down here where that work is being taken out of the system. Friction in this case would be removing energy from the system, making it slow down. Okay, so positive and negative work is the key thing to get out of this whole thing and a bit of work with the, with the equation. Hope you're all happy with that. Um, let's move on to the whole EMIC system. And um, closed systems. Take the whole lot off. So, um, first of all, let's just get, a, get an understanding of what EMEC is. Mechanical energy. Um, it's, you know, mechanical things are doing things, they're active things. Just waffling on while I'm cleaning the board, blah, blah, blah. Okay, EMEC is, as you probably know, made up of uh, an object's kinetic energy plus its potential energy. That's what we're going to be looking at just now. Just before we get there, though, I want you to consider um, energy as a whole. So let's look at a big Venn diagram of energy. You know from back grade 9, you discovered that energy is not something that can be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred from one form to another. So we had have electrical energy being transferred into heat energy or light energy or something like that. And energy can freely transfer to one to the other, but it can't be created or destroyed, can't leave the circle. So that's a closed system. We can also have a closed system of EMEC, okay? It's just this type of energy, which has got our two forms of it, which is the kinetic and potential. And we can have a system that simply stays within there if it is a closed system. So if, it's a big if, it's a closed system, then EMEC is conserved. Okay, so that's even in a law, occasionally it might come up. The sort of thing where that would apply would be, this is a sort of simplistic example of it, pendulum, okay? Where you've got a system here, which has been driven by gravity, and it's going from potential to kinetic and back to potential and back to kinetic and so on and so on and so on. Now, if this was a proper closed system, this would just go on forever and ever and ever and ever. But we haven't got very long to wait, so I'm not going to let it do that. Because in reality, what happens is it, in fact, will slow down and eventually stop. Okay. Reason being? Friction. Good. Okay. So friction is the sort of thing that will break our closed system. So if we want to have a closed system, we are not allowed any friction. And also, there's one other force we're not allowed, and that would be an applied force. Because typically, friction is going to take uh, energy away, like we said in the last example. So the work done by friction would end up being a negative amount. Work done by an applied force would also break the system. Because it would be adding energy to the system. So neither of those are allowed. Um, in, in these kind of questions. So you have to watch out, make sure that there's neither of those two forces applicable. Um, let's have a quick look at then how the maths would work out. It's a conservation law. So E make initial equals E make final. Or the total E make initial, blah, 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 that kind of thing. You can then uh, um, expand that out. EPI plus EKI equals EPK, EPF sorry, plus EKF. Or one step further, mg initial height plus half m initial velocity squared, and the same with the finals. And it depends what level you're being asked to work at. So if you're being asked to find heights or velocities and things like that, and that's the facts that you're told, then you're probably going to jump right away from there to there. Sometimes questions don't even get you to go that de detailed, and they get you to work at that level. So you can choose as to whichever one of those you want to, to, to have a look at. Now, what scenarios are we likely to meet? Well, there's the pendulum one that I mentioned earlier, okay, where it's going from potential up at the top down to kinetic at the bottom and back to potential and so on. Um, 
You could even have a simpler example where an object is simply just dropped from one point to another. There's EP at the top, EK at the bottom, or bouncing up. You see the guys on a trampoline or something like that. EK at the bottom, EP at the top. And you just have to use energy principles, blah, blah, blah. Keep saying that, blah, blah, blah. Um, so those are the two scenarios. And then the third scenario would be some sort of a, a roller coaster or a ball on a track or something like that, where once again, it's got initial velocity perhaps, an initial height, and then it comes down to the bottom, loses its height, but then goes up the next hill and, and so on and so on. So as long as there's no driving motor in there, there's no EFA. And of course they will say, ignore the effects of friction or something along those lines. So those are the kind of scenarios that you're likely to meet. Um, I think to have a quick look at how this could apply, I want to tackle my favorite question, which is the Tarzan question of 2009. Um, if you haven't met Tarzan and Jane in this question, well, I'm delighted to introduce you. Um, let's have a quick look at this one. And typically, again, they'll, they'll combine these energy principles with other physics aspects that you ask questions around, often with momentum, in fact, and that's what this, um, this particular question is about. So, the setting is Tarzan is sitting up in his tree, he sees Jane down on the floor and thinks, ah, oh, she looks like she needs a ride, and he swings down and picks her up. Ouch. Tarzan of mass 80 kgs swings from rest on a rope of length 10 meters, that is horizontal when he starts, as shown in the diagram below. At the bottom of his swing, I'm going to draw as we go with this one this time. Okay, there's Tarzan. And he's going to swing down to Jane. Okay. And um, 80 kgs, at the bottom of a swing, he picks up Jane, sitting on the ground in an inelastic collision. Jane has a mass of 50 kgs. They swing upwards as one unit. The mass of the rope and the effects of air friction can be ignored. All right. So we know that this is 10 meters, we're told, the length of his rope. Say the principle of conservation of linear momentum in words. We've said this already. The total linear momentum in a closed system remains constant. Check out that chapter if you need to revise that. 6.2, calculate the combined speed of Tarzan and Jane just after he picks her up for eight marks. Woohoo! Okay, so that means there's at least three steps. So let's have a look and see how on earth we are going to tackle this. So there's Tarzan, here's Jane. Let's think through what goes on here. So he's going to swing down. The swing. What physics principles are we going to use? Well, it's exactly what we've been talking about here. Up here he's got EP. He's going to gain EK all the way down until he gets to the bottom. He's going to have completely EK and have lost his EP. So in other words, for this whole chapter, you could call this, you can call this, chapter one, okay, we're going to be using energy principles or uh, conservation of EMAC. Then, poor little Jane gets bashed into by big Tarzan and chapter two, we're going to use a different set of principles to find out what happens there. It's a collision. They crash into each other. So as you see that word, or think of a scenario where there's a collision, we're going to be dealing with conservation of momentum. And if we needed to, to find out how high they went or something, going back up again, well, once again, they're just free, free swinging, so we can use the conservation of EMAC. And what's important is that you think through each chapter and there's different scenarios with things sliding down slopes and trains and bits and things. So when, whatever question you get, you need to think carefully, well, what chapters can I break this into and what physics principles apply to each one? So um, let's have a look at what we've got going on here. Um, Tarzan is swinging down by 10 meters. We want to find the speed of the, them combined, which is after the collision. But, we, but for, before we can do that, we need his speed just before we get to her. So um, let's use 
the emec conservation, emec initial equals emec final. And don't fall into the trap of just saying EP top equals EK bottom. They're not going to give you the marks. You need to lay the whole thing out and explain uh, which ones were zero and so on. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Um, EK initial was zero. It wasn't going anywhere. EP initial, well, it says 80 times 9.8 times the height that he had at the top, well if this is 10 meters, then that's also going to be 10 meters. So times 10 equals EKF, yes he has got EK at the bottom, half times his mass times that final velocity at the bottom, squared. And EP is now gone, he's, he's lost his EP. Okay. So, having a look at this, we're left with, uh, let's take that over to the other side. Sticking to my maths principles of not doing any calculations until you put it on the calculator. Um, VF squared over half of 80. You know is 40, but don't be tempted to trust your brain. <laughs> okay. 80 times 9.8 times 10. And that's divided by 40 uh, uh, equals 196. Square root my answer, and then it's going to come to 14. So my final velocity um, is 14. Now that is only the final velocity of chapter 1. We're now going to move on to chapter 2 to find out their combined speed um, afterwards. So um, I'm just going to do it in a different color. Just so that you can follow that this is a this, this is a new section. So Tarzan's final speed <clears throat> for chapter one becomes his initial speed for chapter two. So let's get stuck into that. Once again, an initial statement. Total initial momentum equals total final momentum. They're apart before. So mass of Tarzan times the initial velocity of Tarzan plus the mass of Jane. Uh, times the initial velocity of Jane is equal to their combined mass times their combined velocity afterwards. Okay? So Tarzan, we know, is now 80 and he was going at 14. Jane was sitting pretty, not doing much, so she was going at zero. Then Tarzan and Jane together is the 80 plus the 50, and that's the velocity that we're looking, up, looking for up there. Okay? Once again, let's re-wiggle that, and our final velocity is going to be the 80 times 14 over 80 plus 50. I just got an email. And it's a... Uh, <coughs> oops. 80 times 14 over 80 plus 50 equals... Cha-ching. 8... 8,615 meters per second. Have I answered the question fully? Calculate the speed of Tarzan and Jane just after he picks her up. There we go. So that is the final velocity. Okay, so that gives you an idea of how a energy question can be combined actually with the momentum. Bit a bit of momentum practice there as well. So that's essentially EMIC. I think it's about it. Cool. So take a breather, do some practice on that one, and brace yourself because we're coming on to the tough one in just a minute. <laughs>